Hi guys, welcome to our podcast. Today my guest is Ross Kadast. Uh, is that how you pronounce it, Ross Kadast, right? Yes, you got it. You nailed it. Yes, sir. Ross is the founder and president of two companies. First one is ITS Global, and the second company is Contingent uh, Recruiting. Welcome to the call, Ross. Thank you so much for time. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Oh, thank you, Gumit. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. We've uh, we've spoken over the years, and um, it's good to reconnect and uh, have some dialogue about our business. Start. So if you can walk us through these two uh, companies, ITS Globals and, and, and the recruiting company, you know, what do you do and what is this all about? And, and, and give us a little bit of detail. Sure. Um, so It's Global is, uh, is a company we founded in 2017 uh, because we, we really wanted to change the way recruiting was done. We believe that recruiting is in the service industry, but we as an industry don't recognize her in the service industry because we typically don't give great service. So we wanted to change that. And, um, you know, we, we offer three services at It's Global. Uh, one service is what is called um, uh, RAS, Recruitment as a Service, which is a subscription-based recruitment model, which allows companies to use our service on a monthly basis. We will recruit for any roles that they have, uh, and they just pay a monthly fee. Uh, it's kind of like SaaS, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Software as a Service. Our, our second uh, offering under, under It's Global is our, what we call RAP, Recruitment as a Project. Yeah. We find a number of organizations want to hire, um, you know, four, five, 10, 15 people. Uh, what we would do is we would take that as a project, wrap it around um, a project management methodology and include timelines and deliverables. Um, mm -hmm. Great thing about it is a customer only pays one price um, yeah. for, for all of the recruitment. And the third, which is, uh, which is a new part of, uh, of our service offering at It's Global, is our diversity offering. We call it BIPOC Talent. Um, as you would appreciate, over the last 12 to 18 months, um, corporate North America and the world at large have been looking for ways to engage more diverse talent into their organizations. One, mm -hmm. because it makes great business sense having different backgrounds and cultures around the table. And for this, um, the second thing is um, it's a feel good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so BIPOC Talent just seeks to add more diversity into organizations. So if a customer kind of came to us and said, listen, we want to get more diverse talent in our environment, um, especially around IT, um, women in technology, um, black in technology, um, we, we, uh, we, we sit down with them, we wrap a plan around it, and we deliver resources for them. So uh, It's Global started in 2017. Um, in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, we made a shift. I've, got, I've, I've been in the industry for over 25 years, and I had a number of my clients coming to me, or past clients coming to me and say, hey, Ross, I get the subscription-based and I get the project-based services, but we're a larger company with a lot of process and we want traditional recruiting. So we started, we launched um, a pretty successful company called uh, Contingent Recruitment. Yeah. And what Contingent Recruitment does is your um, perm, direct hire, staffing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're looking for somebody that you wanted to hire in the organization, uh, one of, we can help with that. Also, if you're looking for um, a contract, you're building a tech team and you want, you want a few contractors, we can help that. We can help with that. Or we've been known to work with larger organizations kind of being one of their vendors whenever they need um, enterprise contract staffing. So I, in a nutshell, a little bit yeah. about who we are. Yeah, very interesting. So is it any specific industry you work with? Is it cross industry? Is it a, you know, some area in Canada? Is it nationwide? And how, how big is your footprint? Great question. So um, we are, I would say, 80%, maybe 75% IT. Okay. And um, maybe 10, 15% accounting and finance. Um, and we stumble across real estate as a, both commercial real estate and residential mm -hmm. real estate from an operation standpoint. So we service some clients in that space. As far as our footprint, um, we, are, we are across Canada. Yeah. Um, as far as our people that work for us, we're, we're, we can say uh, we're global. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And we hope to open up the US um, and have some feet on the ground in the US in Q4 of this year. Um, our company, the way it's structured is we have um, 
we have a, a nearshore team in the Caribbean. I'm from St. Lucia, so we have mm-hmm. a, a nearshore team in St. Lucia, and uh, for uh, and uh, they they support our research and our talent um, uh, um, sourcing. Uh, we have we have a team. Uh, we have a very small team in in India that kind of supports some of our recruiters, but most of our recruitment and our sales are done in Canada. I see. So, what what are, uh, uh, state of recruiting? You know, the state of talent right, in Canada. You know, where we are. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, before COVID and during the COVID? You know, we always hear the news we are short of talent. You know, there's not enough talent in Canada, especially in Ontario's being a tech hub. There's not enough talent. We always, you know, I'm short on that. But, you know, so where are your thoughts are? Where are we at at the moment? You know, where are we going with that? You know, um, COVID has uh, created a, a very interesting problem. I remember when um, when COVID hit and uh, everybody shut down in March. I had uh, one client in particular, a bank, having to move from five thousand people on an average remote to. Yeah. 50,000 people remote, right? Uh, and it was a big, it was a big number globally for them and they had to do it overnight. And that posed a, co- a challenge for them. Nobody really understood what, um, most organizations didn't understand what verbal, um, virtual work was. So there was a pause in the market while companies tried to kind of figure out what they wanted to do. Yeah. What we saw is we saw by, um, by July, August, we saw a shift when companies were settled, they mm-hmm. were like, we still need to have these projects. We still need to hire these people. But then a third shift happened um, to the end of the year and into this new year where talent became very, very difficult to, 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 to find or, or good talent became very difficult to find. And part of that reason is, um, if, you, if you recall, the borders are shut down. Mm-hmm. So there's no... There are no work permits. There are no landed immigrants. So that source of talent coming into Canada was very difficult because it's very difficult to get people in. So what we saw in the market is we saw the very good, the great talent that was sitting in organizations and ready to make a move. Their ask was more. So we saw things like um, $50,000 pay increases uh, from one job to another. And um, companies trying to figure out, okay, um, I've got a budget. So I had a budget of $50,000, but now this resource is going to cost me $80,000. So it has made the market really, really tight, uh, COVID. So we're hoping that, you know, over the summer, in the next couple of months, that the market will open up a a little bit again and more talent can come through the borders uh, Mm -hmm. to support some of these initiatives that some of our clients have. So that increase in in a pay scale, you think that did that push... Uh, some of the offshore, uh, you know, uh, remote uh, uh, jobs outsourcing to other countries. Do you, do you think to just keep, you know, keep that cost lower? Uh, because if you're working from home, it doesn't really matter. You work in Ontario or you work in India or you work in the St. Bush, you know, it doesn't really matter where you are in, in a world. Um, so did the company start looking into that way? You know, I asked that, hey, listen, I need to keep the cost under control. If the tax or skills are very expensive here, maybe I need to look overseas. You know, interesting question. Um, you know, I go back to one of our one of our um, um, one of our mission uh, statements um, or our vision statements in the organization is creating new talent markets to the world. We created that before COVID, right? Yeah. And our our mission was how do we introduce new talent um, uh, uh, new talent markets to the world? Yeah. The shift that we've seen is some of that. You're very right, Gurmeet. What we've mm-hmm. seen is that. Um, some companies exploring the virtual world or, um, or remote world in other countries. At the beginning of COVID, it, uh, w- another one of our clients, uh, 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 one of the top 10 integrators in the world, um, mm-hmm. they lost some of their projects because in the, the country where they operated, their, their offshore teams could not get virtual fast enough. So, uh, so, so, whereas, um, and we're seeing this, we're seeing companies saying, okay, listen, I'd like to have somebody in Toronto. If I can't have somebody in Toronto, I'll have them anywhere um, in Canada. If I can't mm-hmm. have them anywhere in Canada, let's look at North extent. America. <laughs> and if we can't find them in North America, let's, yeah. look, at, let's look globally. Um, the challenge is stability of technology. The challenge is, 
is um, time zones um, and and all of that all of that into one. So companies that are a little more mature and used to using um, offshore teams and managing offshore teams, it works well for them. But companies trying to kind of figure that out, I mm-hmm. see I see it still as a challenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one that you, you're trying to you know, deal with a different time zone. You're going to make sure that you provide service in a different time zone. And then the best way to do that is find the people in the same time zone um, to provide the service. But I always, I always uh, consider, you know, think about, you know, why we are so short on talent in Canada, Russ? Is it because we just don't have enough students coming out of universities or is it, is it just lack of people's interest in tech? You know, what's, what's the main reason that, or, no, we, we see a lot of uh, international students coming from different parts, especially from India. You know, we see a lot of international students coming over here. They study here. So, and you still have a short of this talent. You know, what, what do you think the root cause is? Like, what are we a little bit short on that producing this talent in, in Canada? You know, um, I think it's just not enough people coming into the country and a lot of companies wanting to come to Canada. I remember reading an article in, I want to say 2014, and it said, and I believe it was the Global Mail, and it said there will be over hundred thousand dollars of um, hundred thousand jobs available in IT um, in the next year without anybody to 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 to, to um, fill those jobs. Mm-hmm. And you know, this was way pre um, pre um, COVID. Um, one of the things we we see is that you know, if we look at the the, the last government in the U.S., um, didn't make it. Um, great for startups and tech companies to move from other parts of the world into the U.S. So a lot mm-hmm. of companies looked at Toronto as a way, as yeah. a place to come and to build their tech teams. I mean, mm-hmm. I can think now of a, um, another company I heard about three months ago. They're building their tech team here. We have another another organization that we just built their accounting and finance team for them because they're moving their, their, their back office transactional accounting teams to, to Canada because they purchased a, f- a fairly significant operation mm-hmm. in in the U.S. So I think the talent the talent shortage uh, has a lot to do with um, one um, not enough people coming in, okay, mm-hmm. and our our immigration policy probably needs to change a bit. Um, when we look at the universities, um, the universities um, are a good um, gauge. I believe that there are a lot of students going into tech, but the challenge is. Um, the skills that they go in or the programs that they go in 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 this year, four years later, they're obsolete. There's something new, right? Uh, So, so, so I think, I think um, it's, it's, it's important um, if we're, if we're going to grow the tech sector in, in, in Toronto, particularly um, and across Canada, when you look at the markets, um, we, we see Toronto, we Mm -hmm. see, Quebec, Montreal, particularly, and we see um, uh, Vancouver. These are really, really strong hubs for technology. I mm-hmm. think, you know, from a government standpoint, we need to look at how we can allow more professionals in. You know, mm-hmm. case in point, one of one of the things that we're doing for um, our 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 business here in Canada is we're looking at opportunities as well to build a tech hub in the Caribbean in Saint Lucia, supporting clients here. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of talent available there. And I think because of the proximity, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think it, it would be easier, say a similar time zone. Um, they all sound like me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the third thing is, you know, uh, quite frankly, a place like St. Lucia, who wouldn't want to go, right? <laughs> so, Beautiful place. So. Yeah. What's the, what's the state of uh, tech, uh, tech talent in, in, in that place? And also the, the cost of labor. Well, if you can talk about that, you know, compared to Canadian market or compared to Indian market, because that's where you, your presence is. If you, you know, if I'm a business owner, I'm trying to build or trying to scale up the company, you know, if I have these three options, you know, what do I need to consider in terms of cost and the value delivered to my client? You know, if you can talk about that market. Yeah, so so from uh, the work that we've been doing, the, the cost structure definitely is um, is a lot um, is a lot lower. Um, the talent there. So if I speak to Saint Lucia, I believe um, right now it's a thirty one percent unemployment rate among the youth, sixteen okay. percent 
mm-hmm. along um, uh, across the country. And the reality is there are tons of people with, with technology talent, um, um, accounting, professional, professional skills that are not employed in the right jobs, right? And that presents for, for, for any organization an opportunity to, to kind of have the advantage of um, getting this talent into, into the type of work that they studied at school or they did um, in North America before, before they moved back. The interesting thing is if you compare this market to say um, an India, Mm -hmm. which is a very, very established market uh, when uh, you talk about offshore technology, um, India and countries like India, Philippines, one of the challenges that I hear is that, you know, um, attrition rates are high because there's so many companies offering the services that mm-hmm. these, 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 um, these tech people have choices. In the, in the Caribbean, it's virgin, it's virgin territory. So you build a tech hub there, you will probably be one, the only one doing it. Mm-hmm. And um, the chances of people leaving you to go to another tech job, tech job would be slim to none. So, so it's a very, very attractive proposition, certainly for us and for anybody who kind of wants to investigate um, um, how we how we get um, uh, technology hub and technology projects done in the region. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Um, did COVID change any of this, uh, Russ? You know, um, COVID had an impact on in every industry. So I'm trying to understand how COVID impact on on your industry. You know, um, did, did the change in an overseas market or or just only in Canada? How did that impact it? So um, I got to be honest with you. Um, so from a from a recruiting perspective and 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 what we do um the change was positive for us um we you know at the beginning of course everybody suffered uh we made a decision as an organization that we weren't we're, we 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 had one of two decisions to make we shut down and go away and hide or we yeah. fight yeah. we chose to fight so while everybody was laying off in our industry and probably across every industry we made a decision that we were going to hire Okay. We're going to put more feet on the street. We're going to get more delivery people in place. And I think that voted well for us, that we, we, it put us in a situation where we were able to, um, we were able to grow in spite of and, and launch. And, and remember, we're a fairly new company. So um, come January, we were able to, to compete um, in, in our marketplace, in our space and, mm-hmm. and provide a better client experience and candid experience um, than a lot of our competitors. So um, mm-hmm. how it affected us, I think in, in a lot of ways, positively, and our business has grown as a, as a result. Um, you know, had a meeting with the team this morning and we were talking about, uh, we're running a contest right now. And we're talking about hard to fill roles. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, what is a hard to fill role? Every role right now is a hard to feel role because there are no <laughs> candidates, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the reality is it, it, it is tough. Um, it is a, cl- a candidate-driven market. But at the end of the day, I think our clients depend on us um, to give them what we consider the most important resource, which is the human resource to drive their, mm-hmm. their, their projects so that they can uh, have a, poten- uh, a okay. great outcome at the end. Yeah, no, that is a key for any business to grow. I mean, business is about people at the end of the day, right? So, you know, without people, there's no growth, right? So right. especially with the COVID, all business leaders I know, they, they're trying to scale back, you know, scale up again. They're trying to uh, increase their revenue gains. They need their growth again that we missed so much time. Um, so what would you recommend for business leader? What, what can they do now or, or in for the longer term? How can they scale up? How can they build teams again? Um, is it simply, you know, um, you connect with them or, or you know, is, is, a, is a, what approach can they take? Do they still recruit by themselves? Or, you know, how can they retain a talent and how can they grow the teams? You know, I, I, uh, the way I look at it is, is very simple. When I, when I um, need accounting done, I go to an accountant. Quite possibly, I'm a smart enough guy. I can probably figure out my accounting. But that's yeah. not what my strength is, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know. So I have an accountant that I've hired uh, because he's great as what at what he does, and he takes care of my accounting. When we when we started the business, uh, the first hire I made was an operations person. 
I understand recruitment from my background, but I hired, I, I, I partnered, sorry, with an operations person because that person would come in and manage the operation. So um, I think that, you know, uh, if I were giving advice to, to a leader, I say, listen, first work your network, okay? You, 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 you're probably experienced, you know a lot of people, reach out to your network. That may get you some of the people because there's nothing better than a referral. Okay, for your for your business, and then you know after that, um, engage organizations like ours, um, because the value that we bring is not just finding you a guy or putting a guy in front of you. The value that we bring is vetting that guy, walking them through a process that you know we can share with you insights as to how a candidate will behave um, mm-hmm. in in your environment. Um, one thing that our organization does. Um, uh, have available is um, assessments, how we assess a candidate, mm-hmm. right? Uh, as to how that candidate will fit in your environment. And I think those, those are the types of intangibles that um, a, busy, a busy leader would not be able to, to do because let's face it, they're busy, yeah, right? There's no time, you know, time is come out. You know, end of the day, one thing business leaders are short is the time. You know, um, you don't have enough hours, you know, and, and recruiting is a very time consuming process. Um, so what are, you know, if you can work us any, the way we recruited before COVID, anything changed, the process changed during the COVID. I know there's no face-to-face interviews anymore. You don't sit, you know, face-to-face with the candidates or everything is on a camera. So has that process changed quite a bit during COVID to how we, how we hire people, how we recruit talent? Yeah, you know, um, you, you nailed it. One of the biggest changes is that you, even in our organization, we've hired people that we've never met. Right, mm-hmm. we've never met face to face, so so that's that's a huge um, change. The other thing is um, the 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 willingness of organizations to to, and I said it earlier, to have somebody sitting um, in a totally different province or state working for for, for them, and 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 the nuances of of that. Um, I think what we what we saw happen over COVID is we saw a lot of companies in my industry um, shut down. Um, yeah. and, and part of that reason is, is maybe because they weren't structured well enough to, to kind of withstand um, the, 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 early, the early pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, for, for leaders, um, you know, and for, for potential clients, you know, you post a job, you will still get 300 resumes. You will still get 150 resumes to pass. Here's the reality: the percentage of suitable candidates will will be less. So that's what we saw too. With with the tightening of of, of resources, we found that, that a number of people, the a high percentage of the people that apply for jobs, are not suitable for them. Mm-hmm. So a, a big change in COVID is there are a number of people looking for a job that may not be suitable for the job, uh, for for the jobs you have. So what do you rely on? You rely on, again, I said earlier, your networks. We rely on our networks and our networks are, are, are very deep. And that's, that's kind of um, one of the shifts that you'll see, posting what we call posting a job and praying that the candidate, the right candidate applies. Yes. These days are gone. Now it's about building networks, building relationships, having constant contact, um, contact with candidates and um, knowing where they live, where, you know, almost like a talent heat map for where skills reside. Mm-hmm. So if a client were to come to us and say, listen, we want to hire five full stack developers um, over the next, the next uh, three months, we can potentially tell them, you know what, you would probably have more luck in Montreal because you, there's a higher number of guys available there than Toronto, or even narrow it down to Kitchener Waterloo versus Toronto versus versus somewhere else in the province. So, mm-hmm. um, understanding that, and this is one of the big changes I think um, COVID has brought to the recruitment industry. Interesting. So, you know, from a time time perspective and from process uh, perspective, Russ, you know, for me. It, you know, the way I'm looking at it, it, it doesn't make sense business leader to spend time and, and do themselves, right? It makes sense to partner with somebody like you on going basis and, and use your help because you have a, you know, that, you know, connections, you, you know, you have a networks to, to vet all people. Why you see there's a hesitant, you know, some companies don't use, um, you know, service like yours or, or where do you think the common mistakes people make? Is it just a lack, lack of education on business leader part or, or someplace 
Uh, people just not trying to find a different ways of recruiting. What do you think that some of the common mistakes are made in your, in your space? You know, the first one I said earlier, right? And, um, you know, it's, you know, I'm pretty critical about our industry. Um, and I, when I say that, you know, we're in the service industry. Recruiting is a service. We're in the service yeah. industry, but we don't provide the service. So I think past experience is one of the detractors for hiring managers um, or, or, or executives looking to hire. Past experience with with uh, with an organization or a recruiter always kind of um, may get in the way. Um, I think you know a lot of a lot of organizations now. Let's face it, um, cost is a major is a major. Um, it's a major thing that they need to look at and not looking at what it would cost them if they don't have the right people in, pl- in, in place. Mm-hmm. So just as we look at our customer service on a daily basis and are we servicing our clients and our candidates well, I think organizations need to lo- look at what the opportunity cost or what the cost is for somebody not having the right fit. You know, um, mm-hmm. you know, it costs a lot more to hire the wrong person, first of all. Mm-hmm. And in, in some organizations, I speak to leaders. And I say, okay, what happens if you don't hire the right person? Well, I have to do the job. So what happens to your job when you're doing the job of that person? Yeah. Okay. And what does that mean for your business? So I think, I think you know um, when you when you look at cost as a as a as a leader, you look at um, you look at okay, what is it going to cost me mm-hmm. if I don't use a service? I'll yeah. give you a, a, another example um, as a, as a as a leader. I run a recruitment company, mm-hmm. but when I look for recruiters to come work for me, I hire a recruitment company that specializes in finding recruiters. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm a perfect example of. Of, of of what I what I say, right? Yeah, the biggest cost, Ross. One one uh, cost I see that is hiring the wrong people. That's that's the biggest cost in any business, right? Not writing properly, not not going through all the proper channels, and and every business leader knows that you know hiring the wrong person is a, is a much bigger cost than any other cost you can put together in a business. It's cost of, of a business. It's a cost of you know not having the right talent. It's delaying the service. There's many different ways, and you. And your time invested in a training the wrong person as well, end of the day, right? So, so, so in terms of time, the biggest cost I see from business uh, leadership standpoint, and I'm guilty of that. I've gone through that in my career shares as well. Hire right for wrong person, then you have to replace it. And, and the time commitment from your side to train the person and, and educate the person and at the waiting up, that's a much bigger cost on a business leadership's time than anything else you can, you can think of. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I mean, um, having been around for for 25 years and led ma- major teams, um, I have you know I've experienced people leaving my organization yeah. for different reasons, and I have experienced having to uh, help somebody leave the organization as well. And both scenarios hurt, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> both scenarios hurt, and I would say they hurt equally because it's a resource that that's leaving your organization for whatever reason, or, or you had to make the decision. So I, I think, you know, where good recruitment companies or good recruitment can help is to help select, help you through that process, that thought process of selecting the right fit, because mm-hmm. it's not just a resume. Okay. Yeah. It's not just, you know, he has all the skills, checkbox, 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 checkbox. Is, um, is that person going to fit our culture? Is that person going to fit where we're going? Um, uh, also important, uh, have they done it before? Can they do it? But yeah. more importantly, do they want to do it again? And I, I think that question gets answered once you go through that recruitment process. Yeah, hard skills are easy to teach, but a soft skills are, and the aptitude is very hard to teach, right? So that's, that's what you're looking to get, yeah, definitely. Right. That's the truth. So let's talk about candidate. Where their mindset is during the COVID, you know, COVID was very, you know, uh, impactful on a lot of people, especially on a personal life, some health and safety for many, many reasons. Where do you see that um, uh, state of mind for, for candidates? You know, um, are, are people, um, you know, are they cautious? They, they want to go back to offices or they're still asking for more work. You know, where you, you know, a lot of people has them, they, they don't want to go back to office. They'd rather change the position than, than go back to office. I heard that from business leaders that are, they're getting pushback that people don't want to come to office yet. You know, it's, the, the comfort level is not there. What are, you, what are yeah. your thoughts on that? That's a hundred percent. I mean, um, a, a lot of people do not want to come back to work. Um, there are people that 
actually want to actually want to work virtually indefinitely. And some organizations are looking at that. You know, one of the things I saw happen when COVID hit, it's like I said, a lot of companies didn't know what was going to happen. But slowly as the summer months um, changed, there was more, some companies actually reported that their, their teams were more productive working from home. Mm-hmm. And they've actually, some companies shed, shed some of their real estate because they're not going back into, into the office. I think the more important question for a leader is, are my people effective at what they're doing from where they're working? And if they, can the job be done? And if it can be done, are they effective? Are they add, adding value to the organization? Are they growing? And are they adding to the bottom line? I think you'll answer your question yourself as to whether you need to be in person. Yeah. We just moved to, to, to new offices um, three weeks ago. And, um, you know, our, some of our staff, because we have, we've been fully remote since before COVID, we're, we're, we have, we've always had an office, but we always give the option mm-hmm. uh, for the staff to come in. But I think our whole ops team has been coming in from the time we moved. Every day, they're, they're, they're in the office, even if they, they could work from home. Everybody's fully vaccinated. Everybody follows the protocol. But everybody enjoys coming to the office. So I think um, companies will have to give the option, um, depending on the work that they do. Mm-hmm. But I think the world as we know it, um, having a, a, a full office with uh, potluck lunches and coffee meetings, mm-hmm. I think that's a thing of the past. Yeah. Um, do you think that creates a leadership challenges? You know, managing people in an office environment when you sit in a boardroom and talk to all other team and teams is one skill set. But trying to manage the team and build a team culture and same team team environment in a more location when people are on camera, um, you think business leaders may have to pick up different skill set to to, uh, to to lead these people. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a student of this, right? Um, you know, uh, we made a decision from day one that because we have people sitting in different places, it makes sense to, to allow for, for virtual work. And, and it's challenging at times. I mean, you spend 20 years in, uh, in a cubicle type environment with teams in a cubicle type, type of environment. And now, you know, um, everybody's virtually. Um, what that means is um, for sure, shorter meetings, <laughs> Right, but yeah. always touch a, a lot of touch points, uh, ensuring that people are engaged. So the engagement piece is always a tough piece, right? Mm-hmm. How do you engage the teams to work together? And there's a lot of technology. There's a there's a lot of technology that we have right now. A lot of technology being built to to afford that. But the engagement is the hardest piece to get um, to get when you when you have virtual teams. Mm-hmm. But some companies have have perfected it. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So where you see um, it's global, you know, for, for next, uh, you know, this year or later on, you know, where are you guys heading with your organization? You know, where you see the growth path, you know, uh, for you guys and, and, and how big the growth you guys are looking for? Yeah, so in um, Q4 of this year, we're, we're going we're gonna to put feet on the street in the U.S. Yeah. Um, we're looking by mid to end of next year to start launching our technology hub um, offering in the islands. Yeah. Um, we'd love to talk to any organization that kind of says, listen, this sounds like a great idea. Let's talk more and let's see how we can partner. Uh, yeah. We'd love to have a partner to, 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 to go, go into that space because we believe that it's a, it's a, great, it's a great space of, of, of growth for us. Mm-hmm. Um, we, so, so those are our, our two biggest, biggest rocks that we want to focus on um, in, the next, in the next year and a half. Um, we're hoping that the market continues in the direction that it's going because um, and, and we, see, we see that it could continue. Um, and, you know, we just want to continue uh, having the, uh, giving the, the service and, uh, to our clients and to our candidates and um, uh, continuing to innovate, mm-hmm. which, is, which is important for us. Interesting. So, so give us a little more background uh, from uh, your side, Ross. How did you get into uh, um, this Prudner business? You know, what you were doing before and how did you end up doing this? So great question. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, uh, I think 90% of the people or more will tell you I fell into it by accident and I did. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I went to school here in, in Toronto um, as a student, originally from St. Lucia, um, moved, moved here. 
and was referred to um, uh, because I was great at computers. I was referred to a computer company, which happened to be a recruitment company. When I stepped into it, I didn't even know this industry even existed, right? Um, and you know, kind of uh, landed in by accident and uh, grew my career for there. From there, um, pleased to have worked with um, uh, a lot of small um, to medium-sized operations and also large and global organizations in leadership roles. So, um, you know, it, it has been an evolution over the last uh, uh, 25 years uh, in the industry. Ah, interesting. I know I'll definitely recommend anybody who's looking for different perspective, you know, to looking for talent pool or, or any kind of advice, reach out to you. You know, when we send those videos, you know, we'll uh, include your contact information. I'll definitely recommend any business leader who's watching you know, we all shortage on a little bit of talent, you know, reach out to you, connect with you and, and have a chat with you. You know, maybe you offer a different perspective than they've been thinking about, right? Um, add a yeah. huge value to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the one of the things that, you know, for us, I think a third of our business, maybe even more now, is referral. And, and that just comes from um, us just having conversations with businesses and helping them along their business challenges. When we when we when we work with organizations on the recruitment as a service um offering, um, we, we, we become part of their team. We mm-hmm. advise them and refer them to different, different organizations and different uh, people who can help make their business um, work better. So we believe in, in kind of the networking and having the conversation. I'd be happy to have a conversation with a business lead, leader about his, um, about his um, challenges from a talent standpoint and mm-hmm. see if um, solution, uh, a solution can, um, can be offered that would make sense. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, so where can people find you, Ross? How can they connect with you if they want to reach out to you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, you can you can look me up there. Um, I would. Uh, you can also um, look at our website. Uh, mm-hmm. It's global.ca is one of our companies. And Contingents with a K. Uh, yeah. Contingents.ca is our second our second brand. Um, if you want to reach reach me, you can. Uh, my email is ross at it's global.ca. Okay. Uh, I'm sure um, you would make that information available for me. Yeah, so. when we send this video, right, we include all that all that information below the video as well, so people can simply click the button and reach out to you and connect with you. And I would definitely recommend, you know, you're a wealth of experience in this field. You, you, you have a, a huge network and definitely you you have a, a wealth of in knowledge in this area, right? So business leader who trying to solve any talent problem, I will recommend reach out to you, have a chat with you and, and uh, you know, see if uh, it's their business. Excellent. Excellent. I'd be happy to. Good stuff. Happy. Thank you so much for time, Ross. Thanks. Thanks, Kermit. Thank you Have so much for having me. Take care. Take Bye-bye. Care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.